Good morning, everybody. Okay, so I am here in Cairo. Uh, I am in an uh, Egyptian part of the uh, museum here. And behind me, you see kind of a, uh, um, a what was left or mock up of what a simple room might have looked like in Egyptian architecture. So I'm going to read a, a chapter today that kind of takes place in a room similar to this. All right, so I think it uh, kind of works out okay. Thank you for joining me for chapter three. Uh, this chapter is short, so it won't take too long to get through it compared to the other chapters. Uh, all right, so I'm going to start with this. You know now, hopefully, that uh, that you've met those characters. We Yesterday in uh, chapter two, we've met the mysterious stranger who came in and bought Mara. He purchased Mara from Zasha, her old master, and uh, we. And then he brought her back and talked to her and said, "You know, I will give you gold, and I will give you your freedom if you choose to be basically a spy, a spy for him, and a spy for Hatshepsut, the queen." Um, and she's to become the interpreter for the Canaanite princess who's coming over from the land of Canaan, to uh, marry Thutmose, uh, Hatshepsut's younger half-brother. And they want to install Mara as her interpreter so she can get, be a spy and find out. She, her job is basically to find out how is Thutmose and his people for on the outside, how are they communicating? Because they're trying to work together to overthrow Hatshepsut and this mysterious stranger who is all wrapped up, he's trying to stop that. He wants to know who's getting messages to Thutmose, who they call the pretender or they call him the king. Uh, of course, he's not the king yet because officially Hatshepsut has kept him away from the, the throne. And so um, that's what's going on right now. And we know that Sheftu is trying to overthrow Hatshepsut. So Sheftu must be working with Thutmose, we can assume. All right, so now we have, we're, we got that kind of that strange part where, she, where uh, Mar was bought, and now she's, gonna, she's gotta find her way to Abydos, and when she gets there, she has to uh, give that uh, scarab beetle emblem to uh, Sanguin, and he will take care of all the uh, changes in clothing and, and hair and get her all dressed up and make her look uh, like she can be an interpreter. All right, and last thing, uh, this chapter we're gonna, it's called, this chapter is called The Warhawk. So we're gonna find out why Nakonk's been waiting for Chef to, ret to return and what Chef to is doing there. You remember when Chef to saw Mara in this, in this market square? He wasn't there to see Mara. He, he really doesn't care about that. He was impressed with her, just like the mysterious stranger, but he's got more important things to do now. Let's find out what that is, and then we'll talk about it. So here we go. Chapter three, the Warhawk. When Sheftu had assured himself that the street was finally empty, he opened the door in the wall and quickly slipped through it. The Nubian was waiting for him. This way, my lord, he murmured. Well, Ebby, but thank you. Is there good news for me? Sheftu asked in a low voice, following the servant across the courtyard. I cannot say, master. This garden is green and pleasant. Kofra is an old man now. To be truthful, he is tired of both wars and pharaohs, having seen too much of both in his life. I think he will decide to stay here. Sheftu's heart sank, but he, only, he said only, perhaps he may yet be persuaded. The old are sometimes stubborn, master said Ebby. Sheftu smiled grimly. The young are sometimes even more so. He'll come to Thebes if I have to carry him there in chains. I wish you good fortune then. Ebby stopped before a door. He is here. Enter if you will. Drawing a long breath to calm his nerves, Sheftu opened the door and stepped into a quiet, sunny room. It was of familiar design, spacious, rectangular, windowless, but the two outside walls stopped some feet short of the ceiling, and through this open space, which was divided by graceful columns, 
the light and air poured down into the room. In its center, in a chair beside a low table, sat the man Sheftu had come to see, Kofra, the warrior hero of all Egypt, veteran of countless foreign campaigns, leader of men and for many years chief general of all the armies under the first Thutmos, had Shepsut's father. Kofra was now at 60, enjoying a peaceful old age, but he was far from feeble. His eyes still flashed dark fire under white eyebrows, and the hand he stretched out to Shefti was vigorous and firm. Well, my boy, were you observed? He laughed soundlessly at the expression on Shefti's face and waved his visitor to a seat. No, no, naturally not. You are discretion itself. As skilled in mummery as you are in guile, one would never recognize the gold-hung son of Lord Menkau in those simple rags. I must congratulate you. You look neither more nor less distinguished than every other third man one meets in the street, and so are practically invisible. That was my aim, honored one. Sheftu forced himself to sit down unhurriedly, place relaxed hands on his arms of the, his chair, and smile with a confidence he was far from feeling. When you come to Thebes to offer your services to the queen as head of her armies, I promise none but you and Ebi and the king will ever have known of my connection with the affair. When I come, said the old man dryly, I did not know I had made the decision. A mere formality. Yesterday, I spread the facts before you, revealed our plans, and begged your assistance, without which we must fail. Today, I come to hear your answer. And you have not the slightest doubt what that answer will be, inquired Kofra, even more dryly. Not in the slightest, said, said Sheftu. For a moment, their eyes met the old man's ironic and a little sad. Sheftu's dark and steady. Kofra gave a laugh that was half a sigh and moved restlessly on his cushioned chair. Look you, my boy, he said. I was young once. I know what you are feeling. I, too, loved my pharaoh. I rode in my chariot against his enemies and was fearless and smote them down in great numbers and brought their severed hands and ears to his tent and was happy when he smiled. Together we subjugated the whole southern land of Nubia, even beyond the third cataract of the Nile. Together we rode northward against the Kephthews and the Canaanites, and gazed at last on the strange Euphrates, the river which flows the wrong way. Together we returned to the black land with prisoners by the thousand, with an empire. But we were not together after that, not ever again, my friend. Pharaoh knew me not. Once the empire was gained, he valued me not, loved me not, wanted me not. I was forgotten, as though I had never been. The old general broke off, looking down at his hands. Hot merit, you are mistaken, protested Sheftu. There is no name better remembered or more honored than yours in all the black land. Honor I never cared for, nor fame, nor riches, then or now. Beloved general, you call me. Kofa raised his head. That was what I wanted to be, Pharaoh's friend, at home as well as on the battlefield. But Pharaohs do not love men, they use them. No, Lord Sheftu, I have seen enough of Pharaohs. Serve yours if you will, I will stay comfortably at home. And when young Thutmos tosses you aside like a worn sandal, come to me. Perhaps I can comfort you. There was a pause. Then Sheftu said gravely, 
You do not understand, Hot Kofra. Understand? The old man's frown. Uh, the old man frowned in surprise. Certainly, I understand. You wish me to come to Thebes as head of Hatshepsut's troop, especially the two thousand of the bodyguard, who are sadly in need of training. You wish me to train them, inspire them, discipline them, to blind obedience to me personally, so that at my word of command they will rise against the queen herself. I understand all this perfectly. What you do not understand, my boy, is that I have finished with pharaohs. So that's their plan. Now we know. Uh, Sheftu wants to get Kofra to train the 2,000 elite troops who are Hatshepsut's bodyguard, train them to blind obedience to him, because that's what they did back then. The generals were always the people that the soldiers listened to. So he's going to command them to overtake once they have, he's trained them and they have obedience to him. He's going to, uh, when the word comes from Sheftu and Thutmose, he's going to have those 2,000 men who are the bodyguard of Hatshepsut to attack her and get her off the throne. That's the plan. So he has to have Kofra or else the plan doesn't work. But I do not ask it for Pharaoh. I ask it for Egypt. Kofra's fingers stopped drumming upon the table. Egypt, he echoed. I, my general, have you never known that it was Egypt you served? Sheftu left his chair to stand over the old man. That empire you conquered, was that Pharaoh's? No, Pharaoh is dead. It is Egypt's. But by all the gods, how long can we keep it with this pampered woman on the throne? All Syria is growing restive. The, uh, the Kadesh, the Keftu, they have not felt the point of an Egyptian spear since their gray beards were young. And they need to be taught respect. You think Hatshepsut will do it? Pa, she cares for nothing except building more temples at whatever cost. Sheftu broke off, breathing hard. Kofra, still profile, told him nothing, and he had a sudden terrible vision of returning to Thutmose empty-handed. He leaned closer, gripping Kofra's chair. But Egypt cares. Egypt groans under taxes while the empire slips away bit by bit. With you in control of the army, Hatshepsut can be overthrown, and Thutmose who is a man and a warrior, can set things to rights. I think, Kofra, pharaohs come and go. What matter if one used you and tossed you aside and loved you not? Egypt loved you, and she needs you worse than ever before. She is sick. Will you let her die? Still the old man sat motionless. Sheftu had done all he could, and he knew it. He straightened slowly in a silence only intensified by the humming of bees in, a, in, an, in the acacia blossoms outside and the thrill, shrill, far-off scream of an eagle. Kofra was looking at his hands, where they lay palm down on the polished table. They were powerful hands, still blunt-fingered and scarred and sinewy. And once they had gripped the mightiest sword in all Egypt. The general rose suddenly and walked to the open door, where he stood looking out at the sunny courtyard. You are a remarkable man, young man, Lord Sheftu, he murmured at last, remarkable and wise, for you have shown me a thing I never knew. So Egypt loved me. He paused and for a moment longer remained motionless, leaning against the doorframe. Then he turned back into the room. Egypt needs me. So be it. I will come. Blessed of Ammon, breathed Sheftu. He crossed the room and bowed low. In Pharaoh's name, in Egypt's name, I thank you, hot merit. I want no thanks. Up, my lord. It is I who thank you. You've cured an ache in twenty years standing and at last made my life seem a reasonable thing. 
reasonable. By all the gods, it's glorious. Now more than ever, this news. Shaftush stopped, then suddenly laughed. This news will cheer my prince, so that he may even smile upon the Canaanite princess. Thutmose has sent for a Canaanite princess, exclaimed Kofra. Can you think so, my general? Nay, it is Hatshepsut who sent for her. Thutmose wants no barbarian for a wife. He rages like the leopard of Upper Egypt at the very idea. It is just one more arrogant insult from that most arrogant of women, his sister. She holds him fast in a snare of politics and spies, and when he struggles, offers him this princess, as one offers a toy to a fretful child. I, Kofra, she underestimates him. Kofra gave his soundless laugh. A pretty scene it will be, the arrival of this unfortunate, uh, unfortunate canine. When canine? When does she come? So this is the uh, princess Inani that uh, Mara is supposed to go become the interpreter for. And we can see now that Thutmose has no, no desire to marry her and will not. He'll refuse her. Soon. As uh, her barge is at Abydos now, I may reach Thebes before her, unless my good river captain, Nekonk, if you remember, has set sail already, fearing me dead. I must take my leave. Sheftu turned, placing his hand on the shoulder, on his shoulder, as he bowed once again. Live forever, hot Kofra, till we meet again in Thebes. Five minutes later, he was hurrying through the side streets toward the wharf and the sil Silver Beetle, the boat that Nakonk is the captain of. Thanks be to all the gods, his mission to Kofra had been successful. But there was one great obstacle in his path before it was finished. Word must be sent to the king as soon as possible, since Sheftu's own carefully maintained position at court was that of a trusted favorite of the queen. That's what he does. He's a trusted favorite of the queen. He is the son of the, one of the wealthiest men ever in Egypt. He's super rich, and here he is acting like a scribe's apprentice. And remember Nakonk? He thought so. Nakonk kind of thought so. All right. So he's, and so Queen Hatshepsut trusts Sheftu. And Sheftu is obviously trying to construct her downfall. It was unthinkable that he give Thutmose the message himself, and the old palace servant, who used to act as his go-between, had been murdered in his bed two weeks before. So his go-between was an old man who was killed two weeks ago. So he needs a new spy, a new messenger. And remember, Mara's been hired, or told, and bought to be the person who finds that messenger. Remember, she's supposed to search out who's giving messages between the king and someone else, Thutmose and someone else. Sheftu's jaw set. It was dangerous business to have anything to do with the king, so dangerous that it was highly uncertain where he would find another trustworthy messenger who was daring enough to serve him well, yet find one he must and soon. He was still pondering the problem as he came out onto the wharves a few minutes later, perceiving to his relief that the silver beetle was still waiting for him. It was the only southbound ship in the harbor. He would have been in a sorry plight had it sailed without him. A figure on its desk, <laughs> sorry, a figure on its deck straightened suddenly and flung up an arm in greeting. Sheftu grinned as he waved back. Nikonk must have been having a bad time of it the past hour. Well, so had he. But now all was done, and they could be on their way. He moved swiftly toward the ship. Cutscene to something else. At the other end of the wharf, the slave girl Mara was picking her way through a tangle of fishing nets and uh, upended reed boats. She shaded her eyes to scan the line of vessels which bobbed along the quay, their masts swaying and weaving with the motion of the water. Far down toward the southern end of the wharf, she saw what she was looking for, a stout-timbered Theban craft with an embroidered sail. 
For a moment, she stood motionless, grinning triumphantly. Then she started to run. A few minutes later, she was on the deck of the Silver Beetle, looking coolly into the face of the fierce-jawed river man who was its captain, Nakonk. Passage to Abydos, he roared. We're a cargo ship, mistress, high and mighty. We've hides and sheep's wool on board, so many there's scarce room enough for the oarsmen to dip their paddles. Think you we can set up some dainty pavilion in the middle of... He stopped abruptly. From her outstretched fingers dangled a mass of gold chain, the one that the mysterious stranger who was wrapped up gave her. The captain grunted, hmm, hi. What a trinket that is, to be sure. Is it not too heavy for you, little one? Pray, let me bear the burden. He took the chain into his own square-fingered hand, flashed an appraising look into her face, then jerked his head toward a stack of hides at the end of the deck, farthest from the spot where Sheftu had climbed aboard three minutes before. You can sleep there, he muttered. We weigh anchor in five minutes. So now we have Sheftu and Mara are on the same boat, okay? And uh, remember, Sheftu's looking for a messenger that will go between him and Thutmose to deliver the message that the Warhawk, uh, uh, Kofra, is coming to help. And Mara has been hired or bought so that she will find that messenger and then report back to that mysterious stranger uh, in order to preserve or keep Hatshepsut on the throne. Okay, so it's starting to get a little interesting. You can, hopefully, you can understand the political intrigue and, and that they're trying to overthrow uh, the pharaoh, but this other guy or these other people are trying to keep her power and keep the most down. All right, that was part one, which was called uh, Menfi, which was the town we were in. And then uh, this one right now is called Part Two, The River. Part Two, The River. And then Chapter Four, which we'll read uh, tomorrow, is Young Man with an Amulet. And that young man is Chef Du. I'll just let you know. And we'll see how they how it goes when they meet each other, because that's what's going to happen. Is they're probably going to meet each other. They're on the same boat. You figure. All right. Have a great afternoon. Get your work done. Be happy. And we will see you tomorrow.